Thank you very much and welcome to the discuss this discussion on what history should children be taught. Um, it's difficult to conjure up two better contemporary historians than these two to discuss that subject. I found that there's a tendency of a chair at meetings like this to raise questions in the introduction which are better raised by the speakers, so I'll say nothing further, um, except to say that they'll talk, um, perhaps prompted by me, for 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, and then it'll be open to the floor. I'm, um, I, I'm claiming to be partly Jesus between these two heavyweights. I read history at Wadham with Lawrence Stone and Pat Thompson, but I did Renaissance at Jesus with John Hale, so that's something. You may think, well, I did, he was wonderful. Um, on my right is Professor Richard Evans. He read history at Jesus College, Oxford. He's now an honorary fellow of the college. Subsequently, he moved to the other place where he's Regis Professor of History. Uh, he's recently been appointed president of Wolfson College, Cambridge. He's the author of many books, as you know, on modern German history and also in defense of history. Professor Neil Ferguson is a Lawrence A. Tisch professor at Harvard, uh, currently Philip a Roman visiting professor at the LSE and senior research fellow at Jesus College where he taught for nine years at the end of the last century. He's just published Civilization, The West and the Rest, and his other books include The Ascent of Money, and both these were made into very successful and accomplished Channel 4 films. Uh, and Michael Gove has asked him to work with the coalition to overview teaching of the subject of history in schools. So I'm going to start by asking Neil, if you could set out your critique of the teaching of history, we'll go on from there. Well, thanks, Melvin. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight, and I think this is an excellent opportunity, uh, not only to discuss a very important subject, but also, I suppose, in a subtle kind of way, to make uh, former Jesus College members think about the financial future of the alma mater. I don't think anybody who's been involved in the teaching of history at the university level in this country would deny that there is a problem in the way that history is taught in secondary schools. The evidence of this was brought home uh, forcibly to me year after year as Felicity Heal and I interviewed candidates uh, to read history at Oxford. But let me give you an example of just how bad things are at, at rather less elite institutions than Oxford. At a, another British university, uh, I'll say it was a Welsh university just to capture the, the classic Jesus interest, undergraduates admitted to read history uh, were asked some questions uh, on arrival. Only 34% of them knew who was monarch at the time of the Spanish Armada. 31% knew the location of the Boer War. Only 16% knew who commanded British forces at the Battle of Waterloo. And just 11% were able to name a single British prime minister of the 19th century. And these ladies and gentlemen, were people admitted to a serious university in this country to read history. It makes you wonder what the rest of the secondary school uh, population knows about the past. I think the problem, and I'll keep this short because we want a discussion and not an Oxford Union debate, the problem is the way in which the teaching of history changed uh, over the course of the 1980s and 1990s. I don't think it's the fault of teachers, though it's often tempting to, to blame the teachers for these problems. In the United States, it's very much a reflex these days to blame the teachers' union for all society's ills, including climate change. But I actually think the problem has much more to do with the unintended consequences of well-meant reforms. Uh, they were mostly, I think, well meant. And the consequence of these reforms has been to break up the structure uh, of historical teaching and present students instead with a kind of smorgasbord of rather limited scope. It's not the intention of the way in which, for example, uh, 
GCSE has been reformed, that people should only study Henry VIII and Hitler. It's just that that's what happens. You present people with an attractive menu of choices. You don't give them any kind of overarching narrative structure. Somehow, the choices always seem to be World War II or the Tudors. And I think that is the reason that we've ended up with a problem. Because history, if it's served up in that fashion, particularly if one repeats again and again the rise of Hitler uh, or the six wives of Henry VIII, becomes rather boring. The other point I'd make is that the reformers of the 70s and 80s felt they were moving away from that kind of history that was, in Alan Bennett's words, one effing thing after another, towards something that would be more child-centered and more skills-based. So skills were elevated above knowledge. What was called discovery was elevated above, above pedagogy. They're just going to find it out through research. And empathy was elevated above essay writing. Now, these doubtless well-intentioned changes in the way that history was taught have nearly always had disastrous consequences. And to give you an example of what ends up happening once you've put the educationalists together with the well-meaning politicians and then introduced the examination boards into the equation, let me give you a question from a recent GCSE paper. Question 8E on the topic, The Road to War in Europe, 1870 to 1914. It's a bit of source analysis so Professor Evans, as Regis Professor of Cambridge, will be ready for a challenging exercise. The source is, quote, from a modern textbook. The exercise is study the source and then answer the question that follows. The quote is brief, you'll be glad to hear. The Archduke arrived at Sarajevo by train and was met at the station by the governor of Bosnia. He was then driven out of the station in an open-topped car to the town hall for an official welcome. As the Archduke's car came down Appel Key toward the town hall, Nedeljiko Kabanovich stepped forward and threw his bomb. He missed, and it exploded behind the Archduke's car. That's the source. And here's the question for eight marks. Use the source and your own knowledge to describe the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife in June 1914 and its results. I just think that is a very unsatisfactory way of examining historical knowledge, even if there is any knowledge there. And that's just one of a great many examples I could give you of what is wrong at the sharp end of historical education in secondary schools. More and more teachers feel obliged to teach to the examination. When you look at what the examinations do, it's really rather chilling. And I don't think it's therefore in the least surprising but at a time when history is hugely popular on television and in bookshops, it is regarded as so boring in secondary schools in Britain that more people take design and technology at GCSE and more people take psychology at A-level. And with that, I will rest the case for the prosecution. Well, uh, okay, um, I agree with quite a lot of that. You'll be very disappointed to, to hear. But what I wanted to put is my view about history teaching at schools. I think the first thing we have to remember is that history is taught at schools as a compulsory subject from the age of six or seven up to the age of 14. And the national curriculum relates principally to that era. Um, now, uh, it's, to my mind, an excellent national curriculum. It covers the whole of British, uh, particularly mainly English, but some also Scottish and Welsh and Irish history. It covers the whole of it from start to the present. Uh, from the age of 11 to 14, school children are required to learn the whole sweep of history from these islands from 1066 up to uh, the 20th century. It also includes uh, a, a hefty element, in addition to that, of European and world history necessarily in shorter uh, thematic chunks. The, um, the idea when you start off is to introduce children to the notion of time, of chronology, to the idea of criticizing uh, what historians, uh, and, and reflecting on what historians write to get some idea of other cultures, uh, other times 
um, other, other places, um, to have, in other words, a kind of basic grounding in history. That seems to me to be wholly admirable. The problem is that schools cannot deliver it. It's chock-a-block with factual material, it's, it's packed, it's very dense, and above all, therefore, it's very difficult. So schools under huge pressure from what I think are in many ways ill-advised league tables and benchmarks introduced by the Labour government over the last few years focus overwhelmingly on literacy and numeracy and history gets pushed, pushed to the side. Uh, so they try and do, for example, the three-year uh, course uh, curriculum that takes children from 11 to 14 in two years. It's not often not taught as part of, uh, uh, not taught as history, but as part of the general humanities subject uh, or just general studies. Uh, its bits are left out. It be it's become quite incoherent. That's the real problem. Now, in addition to that, of course, we, uh, because it's a difficult subject, a large number of secondary schools just strongly discourage students from taking history at GCSE. They want to go up the league tables by having students get an A or a B in design technology and not a D in C or a D in, in, in history. So only about a third of school students actually take history at GCSE level. That's not a decline, it's always been the case since the National History Curriculum was introduced in 1986, but, but it's a, a decline is just about, is, is beginning to get underway. It's, I think it's declined by about 3% uh, just in the last couple of years. The real, that's one problem therefore, that schools are not actually implementing the National Curriculum up to the age of 14. There are much bigger problems when you get to GCSE and A level. Because here, history is not compulsory, and schools and examining boards set overwhelmingly 20th century history, so students don't get the opportunity to study remoter periods. It's overwhelmingly political history, or it's a strong dose of social, economic, and cultural history in early years. And the worst thing of all, and here I absolutely agree with, with Neil, is the repetition, uh, the possibilities of repetition in schools, particularly in the study of the great dictators. About 40% of A-level students choose to do Hitler. Many of them do, do so for completely the wrong reasons, uh, because they've already started at GCSE, and it's easy. And this, uh, at the university where I teach, um, has the uh, very dismaying effect that students very often don't want to study Nazi Germany at university level. They're completely fed up with it. So when I put on a special subject in Nazi Germany, I get three or four takers. On the other hand, I put on a special subject on post-war Germany, I get a much larger number of uh, takers because the students um, are so familiar with Nazi Germany, but they don't know what, don't know what happened next. So it, it has a kind of knock-on effect. And to my mind, what needs to be done, first of all, is to disentangle this mess to make sure that people can't, that students can't repeat the same subjects uh, that they at uh, GCSE and A-level, that uh, the simple solution is simply to make history compulsory at uh, up to the age of 16, to take it two years beyond, uh, uh, beyond the end of uh, what's called Key Stage 3, and uh, not to make GCSE compulsory, but to make the study of history Sorry, over 16, and simply stretch out the national curriculum uh, from three, uh, three years to, uh, to five years, in other words, to have it cover the whole period up to, up to the age of 15 or, or 16. So I think there are problems. There are problems that are not particularly uh, difficult to solve. Um, in the schools, obsessed with league tables and performance and grades, I think that obsession needs to be somehow calmed down. Uh, and above all, of course, resources need to be given to schools to appoint properly qualified teachers and to teach some real history. Given, uh, given what uh, Richard said and what you said, what do you think are the consequences of this, the broader consequences? Well, that's what really uh, worries me. 
wonder if our sound engineer can get that echo down a bit because it's really quite distracting, I'm sure, to the audience as much as to us. Thanks. That's better. Historical knowledge is more than merely of curiosity value. You can't really be a good citizen if you don't know where the institutions of your country came from, if you have no sense of where the structures around you originated. And I think that applies as much to world citizenship as to national citizenship. Uh, th there are a great many cliches about historical ignorance. When one encounters it at a high level, one realizes just how vital um, historical knowledge is. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, this week in the discussion about whether or not the United States should take action uh, to prevent Colonel Gaddafi slaughtering his own people, according to a senior White House aide, the president opposed and continues to oppose military action, including a no-fly zone, on the grounds that the best revolutionaries are always organic. At first, I wasn't sure quite what this meant. It sounds like the kind of thing you might choose to buy at Whole Foods. But what he meant was that, that there's no foreign intervention in good revolutions. Now, for the president of the United States to say such a thing is absolutely staggering. Because I don't know about you, but they look like French ships to me just off Yorktown at the decisive battle of the American War of Independence. Historical ignorance is a dangerous thing. And it's a dangerous thing at the lowest levels of society, too. I think we have produced a really exceptionally ignorant, historically ignorant generation over the past 30 years. And I think that is going to have really quite serious consequences for the way in which politics can operate in the Western world. And I don't think it, incidentally, is just a problem for, for England or Britain. Uh, it's a problem that one encounters in all kinds of countries, even countries with quite good reputations for historical uh, education. Uh, an, an interesting problem, which I'm sure Richard has views on, is, is Germany, where if you think they're force-fed the Third Reich in this country, that they're like uh, geese uh, being fed up for foie gras in Germany to the point of a kind of revulsion. Uh, if, if history is so badly taught at school that it becomes not just a boring subject, but a subject you positively dislike, then it seems to me that you produce a generation that is not actually very well equipped to make the kind of political decisions the individual has to make in a democracy. So I do think this is, is very serious stuff. Whatever the issues we contemplate today, whether it is the question of whether or not to intervene uh, in a conflict of, of the sort that we're seeing in Libya's civil war, or whether it's something more homegrown than that, a simple question about what is fair and what is unfair taxation. I don't believe historically ignorant people can get those questions right. How far do you, how far do you think, uh, Richard, that this, the whole thing that happened in the 80s was a result, I think that caught the wag, if it comes here, so yeah. I can just shadow it. How far do you think this, caught, this was caused by... Um, a, la a lack of nerve, a loss of nerve in the sort of uh, teaching in some detail of the history of this country, a loss of uh, belief in, in some way, a loss of conviction about the value of the history of this country as a starting point and taking that through in a fairly detailed way. If we were always told, behind what we were taught was the idea is you get your own history right first and then every an in fair amount of detail and build around that. Uh, was there a, do you think there was a loss of nerve, A, and then I'd like to ask you to come in on this, Neil, B, is why didn't the academics of the time raise their fists and fight against it? Well, I, I think, um, I don't see this, I don't really recognize the picture that you're, that you're suggesting here. Um, I mean, when I uh, studied history at school, uh, it was divided more or less equally into British and European history. You did a long period of British history and you did a short period all that's happened with the national curriculum uh, in the earlier years, up to the age of 14, is that its focus now uh, has extended to world history, but the core of it has always remained British history. So uh, 
it's, it's, I think one problem was that, um, and this goes right through the whole education system up to and including postgraduate years in universities, is that successive governments have been uh, very skeptical about the ability of history to teach useful skills. Indeed, the present government has now abandoned any belief that history teaches anything useful at all in universities and has abolished funding for it, along with other arts, humanities, and social science subjects. Um, but the idea that was present for a long time, constantly drummed into the educational system at every level, was that you had to teach skills. And a lot of these skills were completely detached from the subjects which they referred to. They were called transferable skills. Um, and I think in that sense, there's, there's, a very lift, there's not much room for manoeuvre on the part of history teaching. They simply had to teach these additional skills. And I'd like to see history teaching go back to, te to, to transmitting the kind of skills and perceptions and critical abilities to read documents and sources, indeed, uh, that you get from history, uh, from, from at the actual study of history. I just want to do one thing to sort of respond to, to Neil's um, question about the importance of history, which I, or point about the importance of history for citizenship, which I think is absolutely vital. I just quote from the national curriculum. History can play a significant part in promoting citizenship through, for example, developing people's knowledge and understanding about political aspects of history, including central and local government, the key characteristics of parliamentary and other forms of government, the development of franchise, the role of national and international organizations, examples of different forms of action to effect change. This will provide opportunities for pupils to discuss the nature and diversity also of societies in Britain and the wider world. So national curriculum actually uh, is supposed to do this. The problem is it, it doesn't. I mean, one, one thing that's really interesting here is the role played by more or less self-appointed experts on the teaching of history. When, when one thinks of the way people at the Historical Association, Alf Wilkinson, uh, pushed for what they called rather pompously the new history uh, in the 1970s. I think one has to recognize, not that there was a crisis of confidence, but that there was a conscious backlash against what those people felt was old-fashioned history, something that they tended to caricature. And the, the, the way in which the, this particular lobby got its handle on the debate was to pretend that history was being taught in schools in a terribly dull way in which simply uh, students memorized uh, a series of very boring facts, the order of the kings of, and queens of England. And, and I don't think that actually was the case, at least uh, it's very hard to find evidence that that was what was being done in the 1960s when this great attack began. I think it was in part a politically motivated attack. It was interesting that the people who lent its support within the academic profession, i.e. the university academic profession, were people like uh, uh, Raphael Samuel. Uh, my sense is not so much, though, that there was a, a, a genuine support for that move. It was more that we in the universities just didn't bother. We paid less and less attention to what was being done in secondary schools. We didn't actually write textbooks. Textbooks were seen as something that one wouldn't really want to sully one's hands with. And we sat, and I was guilty of this, as guilty as anybody, that sat in our, our studies and watched the standard of knowledge slip inexorably down. The classic, the classic problem, let me illustrate what happens, because I want to be slightly more critical than Richard is being of the national curriculum. The national curriculum is full of good intentions, and Richard just read you some of them. The practice is egregiously bad. You may be told that your child is going to be taught the great sweep of British history. Nothing of the kind will happen. And I know this because even in good schools, bloody expensive schools in the case of my children, it doesn't happen. They don't get the sweep of history. They get the Romans, they get the Tudors, and they get World War II. That's it. And I mean, not many people that I've met and talked to have had a significantly different experience. And this concentration gets to the point that you can ask a 15-year-old, in this case, my daughter, about Martin Luther King Jr. They all know about Martin Luther King Jr. because civil rights is one of those things that is almost as popular as Henry VIII and Hitler. I said, yeah, but who was Martin Luther? No idea. There is not, in my view, more than 1% of people leaving British schools today, including those who go on to read university, who could tell you the following events in the right order and their significance. 
the Renaissance, which you study with John Hale, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. The, the typical product of British education cannot tell you which order those happened in and cannot, in fact, tell you what most of them were. It's that bad. Well, this is where I disagree, I, I guess, <laughs> which is with Neil, because history is not a preparation for mastermind. It's not a, a mindless um, learning of facts. Everyone can ask all kinds of perfectly well-qualified undergraduates at, at Oxford or Cambridge or anywhere else a lot of factual questions and satisfyingly find out that they get them wrong. There's simply too much history to teach. You have to be selective. But you'd agree, Richard, that the things I just listed are important enough that one would expect an educated graduate of secondary school to know at least that they happened and the order in which they happened. That's not too... Am, am I asking well, too much? Okay, no, I mean, the, 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 the serious point here is that there is another politically motivated, self-appointed group of people who are now trying to reform the national history curriculum. They are associated with the Conservative Party, and they want the national curriculum to fo focus all the way through up to including A-level overwhelmingly on British history, with hardly any uh, history of other countries studied unless it, it impinges upon British history. You only have to read what Simon Sharma has been writing about this, who's been appointed uh, by the government as their, their chief history advisor, uh, with uh, Paul Neal being turfed out of this role because his vision is far too global and far too broad. Um, and Sharma wants... that is a slight misrepresentation. <coughs> Sharma, wants, <laughs> Sharma, wants the, Sharma wants, the, wants the focus to be wholly on British history, a very narrow kind of... And, he, and also the other thing is that the government wants it to be overwhelmingly facts. Now, the, and, and not any kind of skills or, uh, in, as it were, critical view of, uh, of the kind of stuff that Simon Sharma and his group want students passively to imbibe. Uh, that, I think, is very dangerous. For me, uh, Simon Sharma is confusing history with memory, and so is Michael Goh. Uh, and so are the self-appointed people who call themselves the Better History Group who have been advising on these matters. They want history to be a kind of uh, unthinking uh, regurgitation of uh, a memory. They want history to feed into the national identity through remembering all the things that we know in life, like Alfred the Cakes and Drake and the Armada and all the rest of it. But I think history as a discipline is something very different. I think it, it gives you, uh, or should give you, a much, much more critical view so that, in other words, you'll be successful uh, if students can take Simon Sharma's account of British history and start criticizing it uh, and saying, where is he coming from? What are his ideas? Uh, and all the rest of it. And just one, kind of one more point. We're, we keep talking about Oxford and Cambridge, uh, brilliant young people like Neil's daughter, and so on. But has anybody actually seen David Starkey try to teach history at uh, St. James <laughs> Dream School? Uh, well, uh, you know that 50% uh, of, um, uh, of, of school students fail to get uh, you know, five, five, uh, five or more GCSEs, that um, huge numbers of them, and very high proportion of them, uh, are failing to get uh, the standards that one would like to expect. Uh, the national curriculum has eight different levels of attainment, and the lowest level is not really very demanding, but even that is failed by a lot of, a lot of students. So we mustn't sort of think that, we, that the system can turn out students with a perfect range of knowledge uh, and who can answer, sit on a mastermind and answer questions about the Duke of Wellington, um, Boudicca, uh, Palmerston, well, there might be more wrong with the system than the students, though. That's a possibility, yeah. isn't it? My sense is that, that any, anybody who'd been given a good historical education would recognize what uh, Professor Evans has just done as the caricaturing uh, of, of positions, a caricature so far removed from reality that it has almost no value at all. Um, <laughs> The, the press, of course, uh, misreports these things, and The Guardian, which I'm guessing is Professor Evans' favorite paper, <laughs> misreports... Well, it's the one that Simon Sharma wrote his major... I, I, I hold no brief for Simon Sharma, but I do uh, want to try and uh, give a sense of what, in fact, has been going on, despite all talk of history SARS. There's been a rather broad effort to consult 
uh, teachers, uh, not only in the secondary, but also in the primary as well as in the tertiary sector, about what is wrong. I do not think it is true to say that Michael Gove or anybody else in a position of influence wants to turn uh, historical education into preparation for mastermind, which is absurd. I think it is a perfectly legitimate aspiration uh, for the education secretary that children should leave school knowing some history. Knowledge is the thing without which all the skills in the world are really very, very little use indeed. And so the, the number one point, and I've heard nobody that's been involved in the discussions dissent from it, is that there needs to be more learned. Uh, the people around the table have not been exclusively the kind of Colonel Blimp figures of uh, Richard's imagination. Indeed, there have been people from right across uh, the political uh, or ideological spectrum. What is most impressive about the discussion is how very few people, including even those who were involved in earlier reforms, are ready to defend the result of their efforts. The status quo has very few defenders in uh, the educational world. That's one of the things that came as a surprise to me. I was trying to have a debate with some of the people I thought were to blame for all of this. They didn't want to debate because they kind of know they got it wrong, and I've even had that uh, said to me in private communication. So I think there is a recognition that the emphasis on skills, and, and what kind of a skill is it to analyze a source like the one I quoted from that examination? It's completely laughable that that's the kind of thing that you'll be taught to do at GCSE. Now, these skills, I think, are uh, of very little value. The aim is to try to make students know some history, not just British history. I think it's a complete illusion that there's some kind of plot uh, of Little England as led, in probably by Simon Sharma, uh, to, to create our island story all over again. That's not what's going on. I'm sure what is going to emerge, and it'll take time, but I'm sure what's going to emerge is something that will be properly balanced in the sense that a roughly half of the time should be spent on, on British history and roughly half of the time should be spent on the history of the rest of the world. And I'm also sure that what is going to emerge, because this is something that uh, the education secretary is very clear about, will have a great deal more integrity and much, much less of the repetition that you, Richard, rightly complained about, so that ultimately we will have a situation in which people, including people in the comprehensives, uh, and not just in good private schools, are covering a broad sweep of British and world history, and not endlessly redoing uh, the rise of the dictators, and are able, when they leave school, to put those events that I just sketched for you in roughly the right order and with some sense of their significance. I do not think that is a preparation for mastermind. It is a preparation for citizenship. Can I just <coughs> say one thing? I just, I, I, I just, it'll take me a second. You keep talking about meaningless facts. I didn't think I learned meaningless facts. I thought they were interesting facts and facts that could be used on all sorts of different occasions. Infinite flexibility and a lot of them lasted with me. So I don't see where meaningless comes from. I didn't and use if, the word meaningless. You did, I'm afraid, awfully sorry. You said lots of meaningless facts, make a note. Well, they don't don't have, it's, it's facts that don't have a context. That's, that's the problem. Well, well everyone, so who, everyone who complains about, I mean, the caricature is by Mr. Gove and his friends uh, of a syllabus that has no factual content. Now, examining board, the, the quality, um, the QCA, which oversees all of this, uh, requires 70% uh, marking of examinations to be on content and 30% on uh, the way the content is used. The two belong together. I don't actually really think that Neil and I disagree on this, um, but to uh, but simply to teach facts does make them meaningless if you don't put them in the context and you don't actually use them for something. Um, I, I think the problem, just, just to sort of um, come back to Neil a bit on this, I think the problem is not the content of the curriculum. It is the ability of schools to deliver it. It's the fact that it's squeezed into too short a time period. That's why you get jumps from one period to the next. Lots of things that the curriculum lays down that should be studied are simply not being taught. It's not the fault of the content of the curriculum, and it's certainly not the fault of a, a lot of imaginary uh, lefties who kind of introduced uh, the study of skills or study the, of uh, things other than kings and queens, which has been another sort of <coughs> complaint by the national curriculum. So I will defend the national curriculum. What I won't defend is the way in which it's been taught in poorly resourced schools that don't think history is very important, 
uh, or above all, of course, the way in which it's somehow lost its way in GCSE and A level. I think that's where the focus really needs to be on during that top end of the history of teaching at the school. Can I just change slightly? You pointed out in, in something uh, uh, that you, in, in an interview I read, that you, know, that, that you saw uh, a gap between the popularity of history in television and radio documentaries uh, in as being the, uh, the uh, material for often very good historical drama and the, uh, the way it's often very well done and well supported by audiences of all ages. The gap between that and the games that you can play uh, which bring in history, that and the way it is transmitted to people in school. Now could you you, you're very eloquent about that. Could you address that now and say why I think it is important to put the one into the other? It's a really puzzling phenomenon, actually, that, that history should be so popular in this country, popular in terms of the kinds of non-fiction books that people buy, popular in terms of the things they watch on television, and a typical history series will get an audience of a million or more, uh, which, is, uh, you know, which is pretty good in these days of multiple uh, television channels. Uh, and on the other hand, this slide in the popularity of history as a subject that people are willing to, to take at, at school. And I, I agree with actually something Richard said earlier about the, the, the amount of time available and the very perverse incentives that exist for schools not to teach history or to teach as little of it as possible. We're in complete agreement on that, and that is something that must be addressed. In my view, ideally, it will be addressed by creating something more like a baccalaureate structure in which history will be a mandatory subject, and there will no longer be these perverse incentives. But I think one, even allowing for that, one has to recognize that something is being done very ineptly to make the origins of the First World War boring. I mean, the origins of the First World War is one of the most exciting subjects it's possible to study. And I can remember being inspired uh, by reading A.J.P. Taylor as a schoolboy and having animated discussions with my history teachers about the timetables argument, about German war guilt. But then one picks up the road to war in Europe, 1870 to 1914. And what one finds is that question eight subdivides into five sub-questions, each as boring as the one that I, I read to you. Um, look at the boxes below. Write down the two ways that German policy, foreign policy changed after the resignation of Bismarck. I'll spare you the contents of the box. It's so dull. And one of the things that's dull about it is that the student is never asked an interesting question. And the decline of interesting questions in examinations is a very important reason why history in schools is boring. Now, here I do differ from my good friend Simon uh, Sharma. For Simon, the aim is a good story. And if the story is enthralling and gripping enough, then you will hold the attention of the students and they will learn. I think that's only part of it. I think as you tell them the story of the origins of the First World War, there has to be a question, and it has to be a good question. Was it all the Germans is a simple enough question, but most kids can get their heads around it. Um, in order to make it clear to you that David Stark is not the only television historian to confront uh, comprehensive uh, school pupils, I, as you may have seen if you watched episode one of Civilization last Sunday, spent quite a long time in Dagenham while we were filming uh, the series, not a place I'd spent much time in before, uh, talking to pupils at the Robert Clack School about the big questions of history. Why did the West rise to a position of such dominance relative to the rest? Why did that happen? It was a great conversation. It's a multi-ethnic classroom. I don't think there were more than uh, a couple of the pupils who were from families that had been in England <coughs> 100 years before, or indeed 50 years before, and we had a fantastic discussion. Everybody was engaged. We ended up coming up with some answers, and it provided a wonderful opening to the whole series. So history is not that hard to make interesting. I think there are many, many teachers up and down the country who are driven to distraction by the boring questions that they're obliged to ask about the past. And that's something which we can change, and change really, I think, quite easily by going back to essays. I mean, this. It's not quite multiple choice, but it's getting close. This is so incredibly intellectually unfulfilling. And I wonder, maybe, maybe Richard has some thoughts on this. I think what we did do, one thing that did happen, whether it was the trendy left or not, was that we moved away from assessing historical knowledge through essay writing. 
Can I just ask you to do what you want in terms of responding, Richard, but perhaps you could say what you would do, and then I think the audience would like to come in. Now, Robert Clark School is a phenomenon, and that's down to one man, the headmaster, but yeah. that's a different story. Well, what, what I would say is that what Neil is doing here, and I agree with him uh, on this, and then end on a note of agreement, um, is, of course, pleading for history to include skill uh, as a central element of its, of its teaching. The skill of answering, trying to answer difficult questions, putting together a connected argument, looking critically at a topic, and uh, indeed writing an essay. So that's, it's not just facts, it's skills as well. That's very important. That's something we must lose sight of. Can I ask you to ask a question if you want to? We've got one microphone only, so if you stand up and shout, I can repeat it. But there you are, you at the front. Uh, does that, sorry, it might so help if you stand up. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I wanted to start actually with just a little personal anecdote, which I suppose is rather more in Professor Evans' favour, um, because I actually gave up history at school in 1971, in this devil's decade. And if I think back to what I remember, I had an argument with my history teacher who was trying to persuade me to carry on with it. And it was a choice between history and geography. And my rationale was that geography challenged me. It made me do something that I wouldn't do otherwise. I loved history, but it was just all learning dates and facts. It was a one-way thing. So I gave it up because I thought, I don't need it to, you know, to follow history at school. I can read that. In, and I did. And I still love history. But that is, I think, you know, a very real reason why, from my generation, I can understand why there was this change you know, in the way history was taught. Because surely some people realized that clever people like me, I was clever enough to go on to Oxford as well, you know, were actually not following through with history. They were doing subjects that they thought would challenge them more. <coughs> However, having said that, so we asked the question. That your question right. is, yeah. may I ask both of you, um, I think, you know, with respect, we may have been sort of fighting old wars. What about the internet? Hasn't the internet and the availability of information, Wikipedia and everything else, unfiltered, unchecked, unedited, hasn't that changed everything, do you think? And how do you, how do we, how do you react to that in the teaching of history? I'd rather take two or three questions then come back to the two speakers. Uh, if you can make it out, one, that is the one on the internet. Thank you very much. And just behind you, can you just keep bobbing about? There you are, just there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thought that the elephant in the corner emerged towards the end of the discussion, which is not necessarily what's taught in school, but how it's taught in schools. Uh, and I don't think there are many people in this room who wouldn't have gone to Jesus to read history in the first place if it hadn't been for a charismatic or at least an engaging teacher who brought the subject to life for us. And as the parent of a 14-year-old who's being taught history in an incredibly bad, boring, tedious, superficial way, you know, I, I, I recognize that we're doing something wrong. I'm sure that among the Jesus historians in the room today, there are many more practicing law than there are teaching history. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, and I'm not one of them, by the way, um, and, and I think that's a terrible indictment, really. And I wonder what can be done to encourage more people who are passionate about this subject into our schools so they can bring it to life. There was um, a hand up over there. I, I did, to, to speed it up, oh, well, you're speeding up. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am a practicing history teacher. Um, I'm a Jesus graduate. I teach history at Comprehensive in North London. Um, I apologise if I am tedious, boring, and egregiously bad, and any of the other things that have been said um, about history teachers in secondary schools this evening. Um, maybe you can ask two of my 16-year-old pupils who are with me tonight what they think about that. Um, and I have to say, as a member of the history teaching profession, um, it is quite difficult sometimes to hear uh, such generalisations um, one thing I would say is that there seems to be um, a subtlety missed in what you've said about the combination between skills and knowledge, the what is taught and the how is taught, and that actually the, the, the how and the what and the intellectual conversations about that in the national curriculum are very different to what is examined at GCSE, that's something that Richard pointed out at the start, and yet um, I wonder, Neil, if you could just reflect a little bit on the difference, because you seem to have confused the two. Um, the second question 
is more about the purpose of history teaching. If we are to say that children should be taught some knowledge and agree about that, who should decide, who should decide what that knowledge is? Should the two girls from North London sat here be taught the same list of facts, meaningless or otherwise, as children who, children who live in rural Norfolk or children who live in Birmingham? Because until we answer that question, who should decide and then what should be on that list, we can't really get back to this whole idea of what the purpose of history actually is. Thank you. Um, there's nearby there, keeping it up. We'll come back there in a moment or two. Thank you. I'm a professor of education at Oxford and also a senior research fellow at Jesus. I was a little disappointed in the discussion because there seemed to be a number of generalizations made, not always accurate in their facts. Um, we've had league tables attributed to the Labour government. Well, actually, they were brought in in 1993 under choice and diversity following the Education Reform Act. Um, and I think there are other, other generalizations made as an examination of a current uh, examination paper, a national assessment paper. We've had no analysis of what existed before. I was actually taught history in the 1960s and early 70s, well before those. We got the Vikings, we got the Romans, we definitely got the Tudors several different times, and I was quite lucky I got Renaissance Europe. There was certainly no broad sweep, and I think we have rose-colored spectacles assuming that people had a, a grand narrative, um, and I do think that we ought to try and ground um, the discussion in the realities. We've talked about more time for history. Well, we have a 10-subject national curriculum. If you put more time to history, what are you planning we take out? Many other subject advocates would look at that. So I do think we need to bring the discussion back to the realities of the classroom, as the last speaker mentioned. And we also need to think, if we want more time for history, what are we prepared to give up? There are many more subjects now that didn't exist when many of us were in education, uh, information technology uh, for one of those. Uh, half the, uh, the, the content of physics didn't exist, as my daughter will point out to me, uh, in the 1950s. So we have that tension between uh, breadth and specialism. And many of us in history have looked in great detail at particular areas of history at university and will spend a lifetime specializing in knowledge. And yet it's claimed we can't study the same topic more than once in the period of a school career. Although we might have a very different perspective studying the tutors in primary than when we're at A level. Thank you. I'm going to ask the, um, the uh, two uh, historians to be brisk about those four questions. And then if we could, if you could move your person towards the back of the hall, because lots of hands are going up there. It seems a bit unfair to favor just the front. So if we do briskly answer those questions. Uh, I've got notes. I'm sure you've got your yeah. own notes. Would you, like, would, you, would you like to start with the internet? Well, the internet uh, has enormous potential uh, in one specific way namely that it can make the course materials available in uh, the classroom much better than they currently are. One, one problem which is really uh, worth mentioning and hasn't been discussed enough is the low quality of, of teaching materials. Poor books, uh, really quite disappointing uh, worksheets. Uh, the internet gets you out of the trap of, uh, of the overpriced and low quality textbook. And I think the next generation of teaching materials right around the world is going to be internet based. It's very important though, that there should be quality control. In other words, that they shouldn't simply be, uh, that, that students shouldn't be let loose on the internet uh, without some kind uh, of guidance. Because we all know, not least in the field that uh, Richard Evans knows best, the field of, of German history, just how much really dangerous, toxic uh, pseudo history is, is out there. On the question of teaching quality, I actually very deliberately said at the beginning, perhaps you forgot, uh, that I didn't think the problem was the quality of, of teachers. I, I really don't think that is the problem. And I, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make in this discussion, especially smart and at university professors, is to dump on the teachers. That isn't the issue. I mean, they're good teachers, they're bad teachers, same is true at university. But the, the problem of, is that being a good teacher is really difficult if you're saddled with uninteresting questions or with low quality uh, course materials. What should be taught? I mean, I, I, I agree that there wasn't a golden age. And even if there was, I wouldn't want to go back to it. I'm much more interested in trying to do something new and better. New and better in the way that it's delivered through web-enabled interactive course materials, and new and better in the way that we aim higher, aim to cover more ground, aim to make sure that, for example, take a, take, take a simple example, Ernst Gombrich's wonderful little history of the world, one of the best introductory books 
on history ever written could be the basis for a wonderful course that it would be perfectly possible to deliver uh, to average kids in average schools with an average teacher. You wouldn't have to do terribly much to that to make it the basis for a wonderful course in world history. That's the kind of thing that I aspire to. Can you take up the other question? Uh, yes, okay, into that. I think that says it, that says it all. Uh, it, it, you know, done the right way, it's a fantastic uh, resource. Um, I think that it just begun to explore. Studying topics twice, uh, well, of course you can study topic twice, if you, you know, once at six and once at 16, but if you study the same topic year after year, as happens at GCSE, A-level in university, then I don't think that's uh, a very useful way of using your time. And of course you tend to, lazy students will tend simply to regurgitate what they've done before and not actually respond to the challenge of trying to do it as a, at a higher level. Neat tables, I stand corrected, Tory government introduced them, but I do think they became an obsession uh, un under Labour. And of course that has some good effects. It's very important to get uh, literacy and numeracy rates up in, in, in the schools. But um, I think one has to keep them in, in perspective. Who decides what facts to be taught? Well, there's a heavy dose of uh, local history in, um, in, in the national curriculum. And so therefore that, uh, that's, that's different in Norfolk from what it might be in, in Want to preach. Um, I do, I mean, uh, underlying all this, there's a kind of assumption which nobody seems to be challenging that we, ne we need a very detailed prescribed national curriculum. It would be nice to see the national curriculum that actually was pared down a bit and gave teachers more freedom to teach what they, yeah. what they wanted to teach. Maybe that would then stimulate uh, more inspiring teachers if they were given their head a bit more. I, I do think it's unfortunate that A level for whatever reasons, which might be quite good reasons, has been divided into two, so you don't have the sort of first year of a two-year course where you used to be free to experiment uh, and give students their, their head before knocking down to examination. You do have uh, a, a now a young generation who are heavily over-examined. We're trying at the moment in Cambridge to resist um, the uh, university's desire to have us uh, uh, examine students in history every three years instead of just once after two years and once after three years. Um, who decides the facts to be taught? So, uh, again, I see more, more freedom for, um, for teachers. Finally, um, what to cut out? That's a kind of $64,000 question, really, isn't it? Um, if you expand teaching as part of a baccalaureate, then what do you, what do you drop? Um, I'm having to face at the moment uh, uh, trying to advise my young son, who's um, two years away from GCSEs, what what subjects he wants to take to GCSEs, and the, the uh, actually trying to negotiate the different combinations that the school will allow is almost like it's as difficult as trying to figure out what kind of railway ticket you need in a, in a, <laughs> in a, in a railway station. Um, so that's a very difficult question. Of course, every, every subject has its champions. Every subject wants to have more time and more space. Can we have some questions from uh, the back, please, towards the back? If you put your hand up, you'll be... You'll get the microphone. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'd just like to come back on um, Neil's point um, that he made earlier. Um, I too am a trained secondary teacher. Um, and it just occurred to me that um, there seemed to be a little bit of blurring of the lines between um, the national curriculum and GCSE. Um, it seems to me that it's actually GCSE that needs um, the reform rather than um, the national curriculum. Um, when you look at, um, for example, the Historical Association's um, survey of secondary schools, 70% of pupils at Key Stage 3 expressed enjoyment of the subject. Um, and it's actually um, the, the GCSE boards that set the curriculum for GCSE. So maybe actually we should be looking towards them. And two or three in front of you, for someone with their hand there. Yes, at the end of the row. Um, much has been said about skills and much has been said about facts, but I think the one thing that's not been mentioned is the individual's place in history. And I wonder, might a more personality-driven approach to history, looking at individuals in history in more detail, stimulate more interest and help people respond and become better historians? And just at the end behind you, about far end there, there we are. Um, I'm also a, uh, a secondary history teacher. Uh, could I come back to the point that Professor Ferguson made about textbooks? 
Um, I think a lot of uh, teachers would like to teach things other than the Nazis and uh, Stalin and Henry VIII, but if you go into a history section of a bookshop, there are very few books, and particularly very few textbooks, decent textbooks, on some of the other periods. Um, I teach um, A-level uh, history, and we do the causes of the French Revolution, and that paper is entirely essay-based, you might uh, uh, like to know. I think we, we can all find uh, syllabuses uh, which we can uh, ridicule, but I think there are also some, some good syllabuses there if you look uh, hard enough, particularly at A2. Thank you. And one more question. There's one right at the back. We'll come back to the front for the last. There you are. Yeah, but wherever, yes. Thank you. I, I'm not a history teacher. I'm a historian who practices law. And the reason why I choose to practice law and teach history is because it's at least as interesting, if not more so. It's more socially relevant, and it's much better paid. What we're doing, year five, eight, nine, nine-year-olds have been writing about the, the use of art as a historical resource. That's not in the national curriculum. It's far more fascinating to them, looking at the whole by an ambassadors as a way into the Tudors. We're using our passions, and suddenly it's bringing history alive, and history is exciting. And I think that's the way it's got to go when they revamp the curriculum. Can you be, uh, again, can you be as brief as possible and answer those questions? Starting with you this yeah, time, sorry. Richard. Yeah, okay. Well, individuals in history, I think that th the point's already been made. Uh, I counted up, I did a rough count of the number of individuals mentioned in the um, general instructions for the national curriculum key stages one and two, and I counted 36. So uh, they have not been banished from history. Uh, <clears throat> and text, uh, well, law and history, of course, I guess you make more money in the law than you do in history. Um, that's a very good reason for doing it. But I hope that uh, studying history will actually help. It will give you skills that are helpful in practicing law. And finally, textbooks. Uh, it's, it's very easy to complain about uh, textbooks. It's a, um, it's a, a real skill writing a good history textbook. Um, a friend of mine was sitting on a train going to Cambridge recently. Um, we overheard two students from Hills Road Sixth Form College, which is, I think, the best Sixth Form College in the country, and rather ambitiously they've been setting my book uh, as a textbook for Nazi Germany. And one of the students said to the other, uh, yes, I'm reading that book by Evans. Yes, said the other, tough going, isn't it? Yes, said the first one, you get really relieved when you get to one of the maps. <laughs> I spent a lot of time plowing through the uh, key stage one, two, three uh, options in the national curriculum because when I started to get involved in this discussion, the, the one thing I really did not want to, uh, to do was to pontificate from a position of total ignorance. Tremendously tempting to do, uh, and I'm surrounded by people who do this for a living at Harvard. I, I, uh, I was really impressed by just how much was prescribed. And here, I think there's a point of very, very important agreement uh, between me and Richard. I, I think less is more. That, that what we've ended up with is an absolutely classic product of the centrally planning state. The notion that one should prescribe in great detail all the things that should be done by people aged between 5 and 14 is, is, I think, deeply misguided. And my hope is, and it's certainly something that I've said to the Secretary of State, that we should aim to perhaps have something which is far, far simpler, in which the role of the Department of Education is mainly focused on standards and not on prescribing content. I couldn't agree more with uh, the lady at the back who expressed her a passionate interest in teaching what she wants to teach, teaching something which is more interesting than Florence Nightingale all over again. That's precisely the spirit that produces success in the classroom. So one of the things that I'm pushing for, and may or may not be successful, is to get a, a, the national curriculum out of the content prescription business and into a fairly straightforward standard setting business, of which the most important standards should be coverage. There should be some sense that people, when they are learning history, do genuinely get from pre-Roman times to pretty close to the present. They don't have to take in everybody along the way, but they need to get a sense of the broad sweep of history. That sense of when things happen,
broadly speaking, the difference between the ancient world, the medieval world, the early modern world, the modern world. That's the most important thing you have to leave school understanding. Particularly the vast difference between modernity, the post-industrial world, and what went before it, but not only that. Personalities, yeah, but you know what they always do wrong in these textbooks? They're nearly always old personalities. There's simply not enough effort made in the production of course materials to target the fact that most people in the past were young. And that most of what was done was done when people were, by the standards of our generation, incredibly young. And that's just never emphasized enough. It's, it's the simplest way of engaging the interest of a classroom to point out that the, the age of the people who fought at Trafalgar was probably lower than the age of the people on average in the classroom, especially if they're doing uh, A-level, but even GCSE. So yeah, and that's where the good books are needed. There is, I think, a deeply urgent need for Richard and for me to take the stuff that we've written for the trade book market and recast it so that it can be used to make exciting lessons happen in classrooms. Richard, at Hills Road, they have taken leave of their senses to set what you wrote as a textbook for kids. I mean, I can't think of a better way, actually, to truly put them off the subject, with all due respect. <laughs> because it's just far too detailed. It's far too dense. But the same ideas and arguments that you make there could easily be presented in a stripped-down way. Uh, what I still don't quite get is why we, as a generation of historians, haven't bothered to do that. Uh, haven't bothered to take, well, our lecture notes, our simplified versions that we put out in the lecture room, and turn them into good course materials. I do think the internet makes that easier, and it's something that I'm engaged in doing at the moment. One final point about the law, since we are, after all, in the law society. There's something that historians should learn from lawyers, and that is the rigor with which the legal profession argues about causation. If there's one thing that's gone badly wrong in the historical profession in this country, perhaps also elsewhere, it's been the steady decline in our grasp of the philosophy of our subject. The ability to analyze causation using the buts for, the sine qua non argument, which is central to legal uh, thinking about causation, that ability has largely vanished. So much so that one eminent professor, now employed by, I believe, the University of Cambridge, recently attacked the practice of asking counterfactual what-if questions uh, by historians, where, of course, a lawyer would have pointed out to him that you can't make any reasonable proposition of a causal nature without a counterfactual question. I'm sure the lawyers in the room would agree, even if Professor Evans doesn't. Well, I'm just going to ask, I'm just gonna ask uh, Professor Evans, uh, as we now must call him, Richard, to give a similar concluding statement because we're just about running out of time, so Richard. Well, uh, there's not much left to say, really. Um, I think uh, counterfactuals is another debate for another time. I couldn't resist it. Um, I know you couldn't. Um, as far as uh, Hills Road Sixth Form College goes in Cambridge, it's the best Sixth Form College in the country, not least because it does set their students challenging books. Uh, like uh, one word I, I don't think they would welcome a kind of stripped down version of, 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 of texts uh, they think it insults their, their students um, I do think we are agreed on actually, we, we've done our best to try and disagree about things and stir it up a bit but fundamentally I think we are agreed that things need to be done, things need to be changed particularly at GCSE and A level, uh, that there's a, a bit of a mess there that needs to be sorted out um, that the, the national curriculum up to 14 does, to repeat, cover the whole sweep of uh, English history and British history to some extent, it does cover the long time period, but it simply is too squashed in, too, too short a space of time, there's too much material in it, that needs to be it was stripped down and maybe extended for another couple of years. It will be very interesting to see what the committee under Simon Sharma's chairmanship comes up with. I remain rather pessimistic about the prospects of it delivering uh, a set of proposals as broadly based, uh, as wide-ranging, uh, and as non-British centred uh, as I'm sure Neil would prefer it to do. Well, I'd like to thank both speakers very much indeed.